What is the most impactful queer movie? Is it Pride? Is it Moonlight? Is it that one episode of The Last of Us where Nick Offerman's tiny face made me cry like a little child? I'm gonna were my purpose. He loves him so much, I can't imagine life for him. Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's clearly Shrek 2. <laughs> I need a hero. And that hero is Shrek 2 because it's really good. It's uh, really uh, gay and uh, he's gonna make your kids gay. Because uh, that's what Shrek 2 do. I need a hero. So, for Pride Month, I thought I'd take a break from my normal form and talk a bit about a film which I sincerely and unironically believe to be a queer masterpiece. That being the highest grossing film of 2004 and, at the time, the third highest grossing film of all time, Shrek 2. A film which at the time received right-wing backlash from groups like the Traditional Values Association for, quote, Promoting the transgender agenda, which sets out to deconstruct the biological reality of male and female. What? So I'm here to contribute to the transgender agenda and to make all your kids gay trans communists by showing you how queer Shrek 2 really is. Happy Pride Month. So while we all know that Shrek the original is trans, we all know this. There's no need to explain, this is table stakes at this point, grow the fuck up and accept Shrek as trans. I believe that Shrek 2 ramps up every queering element of Shrek and surpasses it in both form and content. I mean, as well as just being a better movie. Truly the Godfather 2 of the Shrek franchise, which makes Shrek 3rd Godfather 3, which I guess is also true, but I don't know where Shrek Four fits in Shrek Forever After and, and the Puss in Boots movies. Are they just like others in the Martin Scorsese catalog? That's, that's getting away from me. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Anyway, I'm here to revel in Shrek 2's queerness, but first to appreciate the cats here. Hello, cat. Want to say hi? Here's a real puss. But first, to appreciate the true depth of this masterpiece, we're going to have to take a brief tour into medieval French poetry and compulsory heterosexuality. So, we all intuitively know that the worlds of fairy tales and their various reinterpretations reinscribe patriarchal heteronormative cultural narratives. This is especially clear with the Disney reinterpretations of fairy tales. You know, the prince and the princess, the passive princess and the classic romance, and all the metaphors, doves and roses, and walled castles. But we can actually trace a lot of these fairy tale and romance tropes back to medieval chivalry tales, and in particular to the medieval French poem The Roman de la Rose. The French, the simultaneously gayest and most homophobic nation. It's appropriate. The Roman de la Rose was one of the most popular romance poems of the medieval era, likely influencing Chaucer and a number of subsequent chivalry tales. It traced the whole act of romantic courtly love, whereby the knightly lover quests to invade the conquest's walled garden and claim a kiss from his rose. Rose being both the name of the conquest and the metaphorical symbol of a woman's sexuality. Really great stuff. Uh, as is quite apparent, this symbology has been embedded within cultural depictions of heterosexual romance and fairy tales for centuries now. Not just through popular depictions of fairy tales like Disney's various princess stories, but through modern understandings of, you know, love as a conquest. Men uh, considered the agents, women, their objectified conquests. It's 
of course part of the rape culture which permeates patriarchal society. And combined with the widely understood view of fairy tales as pedagogical tools used to teach children what is right or wrong or what is socially acceptable and what is not, I'll never lie again. the genealogy of the Roman de la Rose through Disneyfied fairy tales stories helps us understand that the world which Shrek is directly satirising is one of heteronormativity, patriarchy and uh, the sexuality produced by these systems. And with this we can stop talking about medieval poetry and finally get to some fucking Shrek! Yes! So, with that context in mind, we can finally get back to why we're here. That Shrek 2 is a queer masterpiece and it relates definitively upturning the, the history of the Roman de la Rose. So like the original, Shrek 2 begins with the classic fairy tale storybook being opened and narrated, this time not by Shrek, but by the upper class knightly accent of Prince Charming. Once upon a time, in a kingdom far, far away, the king and queen were blessed with a beautiful baby girl. Perhaps indicating that this will be more of a uh, upturning of that classic fairy tale, that classic romance, uh, chivalry story, that classic heteropatriarchal story. And here, this Prince Charming is narrating how his story is supposed to go. It's the Roman de la Rose, the knight embarking on a quest across perilous conditions, blistering winds and scorching deserts, breaking into the walled keep of, her, of the princess, entering her chamber. Oh, that's also gross. All to win her kiss and break the dreaded curse. A curse to which we will later return. And it was destiny that his kiss would break the dreaded curse. Yet this story of heteronormative patriarchy is ironic for all of us who already know that Fiona has left the keep and embraced her cursed side to be with Shrek, a marginalised figure excluded from mainstream society. And the irony builds as Prince Charming moves slowly towards Fiona's apparent sleeping figure, puckering up as he goes, ready to kiss a passed out lady. Not to say that heteronormativity is intimately tied to rape culture, but, you know. But as he pulls back the curtains, he doesn't find his passed out princess waiting to be conquered, but a gender-confused wolf reading a uh, pig pornography. What? We'll leave the pig porn for now, I think. Um, but the point to make here is that the stakes are set early in this queer masterpiece. The role of the princess isn't empty, but is instead filled with a literal avatar for breaking down gender binaries and flipping the notions of virtue and villainy on their head. The wolf may be a villain in the fairy tale, but we know them as part of Shrek and Fiona's found family. Whereas we can already see you can already tell from his sleaze that Charming is anything but a virtuous figure. Already the centuries old narrative of patriarchal heteronormative romance is being flipped on its head as Shrek 2 starts its holy work of turning all your kids gay. Work that continues immediately as the film cuts to Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon, scored with the song Accidentally in Love. An obvious nod to the queerness of their relationship. They're not meant to have fallen in love. That's not part of the story of heterosexuality. It was accidental, but it happened. And we can see the ways in which Shrek and Fiona, despite performing a classic ritual of heteronormative love in marriage, uh, they remain marginalised from the rest of society and reject compulsory heterosexuality. Indeed, Fiona throwing the classic Disney princess of the Little Mermaid back into the fucking sea as the oceanic force of nature attempts to literally push heteronormativity onto Shrek can clearly be read as a rejection of compulsory heterosexuality. Moreover, while Shrek and Fiona perform romantic acts like slow motion running through the flowers, their marginalisation comes flying at them in the form of pitchforks and murderous intent from the villagers. Is it? Any wonder then that upon returning to their marginal safe space of the swamp, 
that Shrek declares how good it is to be home. It's so good to be home. But this return and their expression of queer love, symbolic of their comfort, is interrupted by the trumpeters who arrive from the embodiment of the idealised heteronormative love of far, far away. The disciplinary force of normative behaviour already foreshadowed by the silencing of the funky individual trumpeter. Enough, Reggie. Sad. Sad. These trumpeters herald a call home to Fiona, now that the king and queen can be sure that she's free of her queer side, for which she was imprisoned in the tower in the first place, now that she has been rescued by her Prince Charming. Your, uh, uh, Prince Charming. An ironic foreshadowing of Prince Charming's later charade of pretending to be Shrek. And you can see in this scene how Shrek has long been living out in the queer world, familiar with the way in which the heteronormative world sees him in this exchange. I mean, don't you think they might be a bit shocked to see you like this? He knows that Fiona's parents, despite everything Fiona thinks she knows about how parents are supposed to act and they're supposed to have unconditional love for their children, he knows that they're likely to reject her when they see that she's not playing by the patriarchal rules. Despite being married and performing that aspect of heteronormativity, Shrek knows that they will likely not be accepted. But he acquiesces, and Shrek, Fiona and Donkey make their way to the heart of the heteronormative patriarchy, far, far away. It's gonna be champagne wishes and caviar dreams from now on! Now, the structuring of Far, Far Away to be analogous to Hollywood is fascinating. We can almost see it as a deliberate invocation of the long history of queer filmmakers being hidden within the heart of Hollywood, telling and retelling the stories of heteronormativity, remaking the Roman de la Rose while in their hidden lives, existing diametrically opposed to its message. And even the song that plays, Funky Town, A disco classic, itself a genre closely associated with gay culture, literally invites us to think something off here, something a little bit funky. Indeed, as we know, Fiona's father, the king himself, analogous to hidden queer Hollywood filmmakers who project heteronormative cultural artifacts uh, onto the world, is himself a hidden queer. Or maybe a hidden French, but again, the French, the gayest and most homophobic nation, as previously discussed. So it works still. Turn the friggin' frogs gay! Do you understand that? But Shrek understands that this centre of heteropatriarchy is not a safe space for him or Fiona, as he declares, We are definitely not in the swamp anymore. This intuition is proven horrendously correct as the carriage doors open to the kingdom. Dubs are released by the best character in the movie. <laughs> I love that little freak. And silence immediately falls. A dove, a classic symbol of heterosexual, chivalrous romance, crashes into the symbolic structure of the castle and falls down dead at Fiona's parents' feet. It's hard not to read this as the expression of the fear every queer person has in coming out to their parents and to the world as a symbol of heterosexuality falls at her parents' feet and their visible disgust as her non-conformity is revealed. It's a scene too heartrending and awkward even for Donkey, who has little social awareness and the stomach to do some presumably wild things to get his dragon wife pregnant, like wild things. Like, wild. Think about it. Wild. Like, presumably, he just has to, like, climb up there and, like, fucking... <laughs> from the inside? Right? That must be how it works. Just, just spraying... <laughs> that must be what happens. Or, like, does she lay egg first and then he goes around... 
seems like unaware that she might be pregnant, which means that that wasn't like a reproductive thing for them. Like that was just a, that was just something that he wanted to do. Anyway, as this scene plays out, we get the king laying out again how the fairy tale romance of the rose is supposed to work and threatening to simply abandon his daughter again. Wasn't she supposed to kiss Prince Charming and break the spell? Now here's our chance. Let's go back inside and pretend we're not home. We get another invocation of locking Fiona in a tower to fix her. They locked you in a tower. Hey, that was for my own good. It's here that we can draw attention to the tower, which I think we can understand as a form of conversion therapy. Forcing Fiona away to fix her, to cure her of a curse which afflicts her. And the curse is obviously queerness. E acceptance isn't an option, so compulsory heterosexuality has to be forced onto it. And we'll return again to this alongside some other classic means of imposing patriarchal power, which the king and the fairy godmother subject Fiona to. Now though, we move to the awkward family dinner. As it's clear that Shrek is blamed for cursing Fiona. So I suppose any grandchildren I could expect from you would be... Ogres. Yes. Queerness, it seems, takes the form of a social contagion, and even when Fiona tries to emphasise Shrek's class position as a landowner Shrek owns his own land. to appeal to the king's bourgeois sensibilities, or not bourgeois, I guess feudal sensibilities, one of the several times in the movies that links heteronormative patriarchy and the prevailing economic conditions, Hello Marx. The king merely dismisses him. Yet, in this moment, the shortcomings of the Queen's largely friendly, liberal allyship is revealed as her appeal to the heteronormative family structure is what sets off the zenith of this confrontation. I suppose that will be a fine place to raise the children. And in this confrontation we get another sick justification of the King sending Fiona to conversion therapy as it was, in his words, I only did that because I loved her. At which culminates with Fiona storming out, unable to deal with the confrontation of the king's bigotry and Shrek's, frankly, completely justifiable, angry reaction to the same violent bigotry he's been subject to her whole life. His whole life. Her whole life. You know, it's the sort of attitude that had people trying to literally lynch him and his wife in, in the start of the film. No wonder he reacts badly to it. <laughs> Now let's go before they light the torches. But this scene transitions to her first interaction with the major antagonist of this film. Not the king, but the fairy godmother. Boo hiss. In this first showing of the fairy godmother, she appears to set things right for Fiona, to get them back on track, back onto the Roman de la Rose patriarchal heterosexual tracks, back on the uh, straight and narrow. I'm here to make it all better. But interestingly, like, the fairy godmother appears almost as a drag figure, extremely camp, singing with sparkles and pink. But that obscures that she's just trying to uphold the entire social order of heteropatriarchy. Not just with getting her son to be king, but the heteronormative beauty standards as well. Just look at the lines of her introductory song. Banish your blemishes, tooth decay, till your eyes will fade away. When as transphobes, homophobes and bigots will trot out bullshit like uh, drags misogynistic because it's a cosplay of womanhood. What's clear here is that the fairy godmother has stolen this camp aesthetic of gay culture to perversely uphold heteronormativity. Just look at how she treats poor Kyle. This sort of, this stolen aesthetic, uh, this, this like camp drag aesthetic, it adds an extra layer of stolen culture and insidious to her, insidiousness to her character. She should be an ally with such aesthetics, but it's clearly nothing but an enemy and a class traitor, probably. Her enmity is confirmed as she says, Your husband? What? Well, what do you say? When did this happen? Shrek is the one who rescued me. But that can't be right! Love isn't right for her unless it follows the established story which involves making her son, Prince Charming, king. And indeed, this is the same for Fiona's father as he rails against Fiona not following the plan. She was supposed to choose the prince we picked out for her! Compulsory heterosexuality. 
rears its monstrous head. But the plan, this heteronormative plan, isn't even his one, as it's revealed that the fairy godmother, the symbol of making wishes come true for the heterosexual order, is the true villain of the story. You see, we made a deal, Harold, and I assume you don't want me to go back on my part. The fairy godmother reveals her pure queer phobia and the skin-deep meaning behind her drag aesthetic as she dismissively labels the wolf as gender confused. Some gender confused wolf telling him that his princess if I could is already married. Then immediately, basically threatens to out the king unless he enforces the marriage of Princess Fiona and Prince uh, Prince Charming. If compulsory heterosexuality is an agent in this film, it is the fairy godmother. She's an enemy to all queers. Outing someone, as we all know, is one of the most violent things you can do to a queer person. But this exists both at the personal level and the systemic level, as the threat to the king is immediately followed by her invocation of maintaining the heteropatriarchal state. It's what's best, not only for your daughter, but for your kingdom. Make Fiona conform to the heteronormativity, and it will be the best thing for the kingdom itself. Shrek's degeneracy will be expunged in favour of this white avatar for public straightness. Prince Charming, who actually we can only assume is struggling with his own queerness. Indeed, later in the film, Charming says he's simply I'm just playing the part, Fiona. Which, combined with the meta-textual narrative of his voice actor being Rupert Everett, who famously remained closeted in Hollywood for years, one must wonder if one of the reasons for the fairy godmother's obsession with getting Charming to marry Fiona is to impose compulsory heterosexuality on him too. The normative health of society is represented by its highest avatar's conformity to normative heteropatriarchal standards. But with this demand from fairy godmother to restore the natural order, the king moves down to somewhere he knows from his past. A marginal haunt where those who are excluded from the heteropatriarchal order of the kingdom gather as a gay bar. There, the king meets a frog he presumably used to date before he started hiding his queerness and ascended to the heart of heteropatriarchal society. You know, before he assimilated. Do I know you? Turn the friggin' frog gay! Do you understand that? He also meets the ugly stepsister. Now, stay with me here. While this representation is clearly transphobic, though not enough for the traditional values association, if we look at her from a queer lens, who's labelled her ugly? It's the fairy tale establishment, it's the king and the fairy godmother, because she doesn't fit within the narrow bounds of heteropatriarchy. As far as I can tell, she's just a nice woman doing her job, making her way in the world, constantly reminded by those in power that she'll never be accepted. Excluded to this position of marginality for no other reason than who she is. She even offers drinks and consolation to Shrek and the gang later in the film, as they too are excluded to marginality. And recall the theme in Shrek, of virtue and villainy being upended. I think this scene where the, these villainous characters are excluded should play into that now, that, that theme. Are they, are they villainous? Are they just people just going about their daily lives? Are they just nice people who have been excluded? But once the king has hired another mercenary to kill Shrek, the bisexual king Puss in Boots, oh, he sounds dreamy. we return to Shrek, gripped in anxiety and unable to sleep. Notably, this queer couple is sleeping under a blanket emblazoned with a rainbow. Coincidence? I think not! But around the room are symbols of all of the ways in which young Fiona was conditioned intra heteronormativity from the poster of Sir Justin above the bed to the mechanical clockwork dolls going through the motions of heterosexuality to the doll setup that shows how the Roman de la Rose is supposed to go, complete with the doll repeating Fiona's exact phrase. I pray that you take this favour as a token of my gratitude. It's clear that this represents how, before Fiona met Shrek, she was just mechanically going through the motions of compulsory heterosexuality, not really herself. And as Rich argues, Heterosexual romance has been represented as the great female adventure, 
duty and fulfilment. We may faithfully or ambivalently have obeyed the institution, but our feelings and our sensuality have not been tamed or contained within it. Contained within the mechanical, soulless avatars of Fiona's childhood. And when Shrek opens her childhood diary, we can see how from an early age that despite all the conditioning, she was still straying from the path of heteronormativity. Her parents don't allow her to go to sleepovers with other girls. Sleeping Beauty is having a slumber party tomorrow, but Dad says I can't go. Hmm. And then they send her away to, again, uh, what can clearly be read as conversion therapy. Confinement to rid her of her queer side. And this scene, I think, is the perfect one to talk about some of the features of compulsory heterosexuality. Yeah, in the original essay, the author draws some attention to some specific means of patriarchal domination which are used to control women and force them into this sort of heterosexuality. Relating to the confinement in the tower, rich lists uh, the denying of female sexuality through punishment, like chastity belts, and their physical confinement, whether that is within the home or within a dragon-guarded castle. You know, these are means of imposing patriarchal control and compulsory heterosexuality. Two modes of power clearly imposed on Fiona. A second feature which is listed is the objectification of women within patriarchal transactions. That is, the use of women as brides to be traded. And we can see this is the case with Fiona, as the fairy godmother's entire plot reveals around striking a deal with Fiona's father to basically sell her to Prince Charming as a bride. Fiona and Charming will be together. Yes. For both Fiona's good and the systemic good of the kingdom. And finally, patriarchal power is communicated through the production of and reproduction of patriarchal culture, through romance, fairy tales, fucking Disney. And we can see this throughout Fiona's room, with the picture of Sir Justin, the clock and the toys, as well as Fiona's childish repetition of Mrs. Fiona Charming. The dream she has been told to acquiesce to is to be a wife. No longer herself, but simply an extension of her Prince Charming. In this queer masterpiece, the upturning of the very form of fairy tale literature represents the upturning of one of the modes of culturally forcing patriarchal ideology and heterosexual uh, conditioning on women. This happens both metatextually with the form of the film itself as like a satire of fairy tales, but also textually with Princess Fiona's teenage bedroom and her diary, which it's clear that Fiona has moved beyond. Moving on then. As Shrek reads of the abuse and conditioning imposed upon Fiona by her family and is understandably freaked out, he is interrupted by the king, setting in motion his malicious plot, invoking the nuclear family relation to try and ingratiate Shrek to him while shoring up the ultimate validity of that nuclear family. Uh, please call me dad. Dad. While, by contrast, Shrek denigrates his own identity to get the king on side. We both acted like ogres. It's also tragically one-sided. The abandonment of his own identity to acquiesce to the kings is it's sad. And as this plot, this plan from the king is triggered, Shrek is confronted by bisexual icon Puss in Boots. Oh, he sounds dreamy. And Puss in Boots is interesting because he represents this symbol of masculinity, yet is turned cute and fluffy. He also symbolises the hypersexuality, hypersexualization of foreign men, uh, which is interesting. The cuteness of Puss in Boots shows this peripheral position of immigrant men uh, and, and the roles they play within the bounds of white heteropatriarchy. And interestingly, there's a reference to Alien here as well, a film which has been widely interpreted as a queer story and specifically a trans one. But anyway, that this murder attempt, this latest murder attempt on Shrek doesn't make him want to further reject heteropatriarchy, but tragically kind of breaks him. He wants to now search for a way to assimilate. It's all too much. The, the constant attempts in his life and the, the stress and trauma on, on Fiona, whom he loves, makes him want to search for a way to assimilate into heteropatriarchy. 
thereby making Fiona's life easier. Maybe Fiona would have been better off if I were some sort of Prince Charming. And this is mirrored by the following scene when Fiona confronts her father as she looks for Shrek and he reacts with horrendous bigotry and another example of the king pathologizing Shrek as somehow infecting Fiona as a, a social contagion. I mean, look at what he's done to you! The power of the king's words reflect the attitude of society as a whole. And so, as Shrek understandably wants to assimilate now, uh, to make his and Fiona's lives easier, his, he and his companions make their way to the fairy godmother. And they're confronted with one of the clearest metaphors in the movie for the nature of this wider social structure. As we look to the fairy godmother's cottage and suddenly it pulls back to reveal it, not as a cute little uh, idyll, but as a factory. She's the largest producer of hexes and potions in the whole kingdom. The fairy godmother's heteropatriarchy is tied intimately to capitalism. This isn't two systems, but one as is clear from her abuse of her staff, her domination of the proletariat, and how quick they are to trust any union official who can help. The staff feel oppressed. You feeling at all degraded or oppressed? Uh, a little. Well, we don't even have dental. Oppression within the sphere of production and expanded beyond it. And within the heart of this horrendous factory of capitalist heteropatriarchy, a factory and a social factory, we come across the fairy godmother, who's essentially making a date rape drug or love potion to force Fiona to abandon her queerness. And just a hint of And as Shrek interrupts the process, the godmother reacts by going through all the literature which is used to impose this patriarchal condition on women to illustrate how his relationship with Fiona is unacceptable to the, ex the established canon. Sleeping Beauty, oh, no ogres. Hansel and Gretel, no. Thumbelina, no. The ogres don't live happily ever after. It can only accommodate this narrow view of sexuality, this heterosexuality. And the effects this has on Shrek are tragically quite clear, as he then immediately goes on to try and steal the means of achieving heterosexual assimilation in a sequence scored with the song Ever Fallen In Love With Someone You Shouldn't Fall In Love With, which also contains a reference to uh, the most trans film series ever, The Matrix. That's quite a few uh, references to other queer pieces of art throughout this uh, singular masterpiece. And as Shrek makes his escape, he is surrounded, shrouded, in workers transformed into dubs. That is, transformed into the very symbol of chivalrous heterosexual romance. Yet, as we know, this attempt to fit into heteronormativity is misguided, as it is immediately co-opted into the fairy godmother's plan. The hard, hard limits of assimilatory queer politics are immediately on display. They'll never accept us, no matter how hard you might want to appear normal. We don't seek to be accepted by heteropatriarchal capitalism. We seek to smash it. And this plan for assimilation is clearly demonstrated as a mushroom which had some potion sneezed onto it gets transformed into the very symbol of heterosexual romance. The rose. The romance of the rose. Uh, but in a moment of real tragic irony, as this rose appears, Fiona immediately rejects the story. She realises that this world is not one in which she or Shrek are safe or welcome, and she tries to leave. But before she can, the force of compulsory heterosexuality in the form of this potion, this spell, literally confines her on the border of her castle, forcibly detransitioning her through the spell and forcing Shrek and Donkey into this heteronormative ideal. It's not incidental that both Shrek and Donkey are whitened, is it? The ladies seen my donkey. Who are you calling donkey? But as they walk through the town, with this new visage of assimilation to the song Changes playing, another song with clear queer undertones, clear overtones, uh, Shrek begins to experience for the first time in his life what it's like to be accepted by wider society. It feels good, it feels safe, the pitchforks are no longer murderous but just objects. He doesn't need to fear the random man on the street, he gets a taste of assimilation. But as he approaches the castle, 
we get another symbol of heteronormativity as a dove flies up to Fiona's window as her detransition into patriarchy has occurred against her wishes. And this is all the more ironic as Shrek's dream of assimilation is shattered immediately by the fairy godmother who forces him to watch from a distance as Prince Charming imitates Shrek and to Shrek gets that assimilated nuclear family life that he was trying to achieve. As the fairy godmother calls him Pigeon, not Dove, but a grey shadow of the hetero ideal, Pigeon. I don't think they can hear us, Pigeon. And tells him to let her go. Shrek realises that he can never assimilate and believes that if that's what Fiona wants, then he has to leave. And he trudges back to the poison apple bar, the physical position of marginality, away from the heart of patriarchal and heteronormative society of far, far away. The song, People Just Ain't No Good, please. People just ain't no good. Which people? For Shrek, it's himself. For us, it's Prince Charming and the Fairy Godmother. And notice here the return of the ugly stepsister. Only, she's not referred to here by that violent moniker uh, as she was when the symbolic head of heteropatriarchy, the king, came into her bar. But it's called by her name. Just leave the bottle, Doris. Hey, why the long face? Doris, by the bisexual icon Puss in Boots. This is one of the things that really makes it clear that it's the contingent structures of power and domination that have labelled her ugly and not those who share her position of marginality. But here, this is Shrek's lowest moment. He believes the propaganda of compulsory heterosexuality. That there's no choice in stopping the established story. That is, until he overhears the godmother and Prince Charming threatening the king again by outing him to the world to drug Fiona and force her to fall in love with Prince Charming. You can't force someone to fall in love? <laughs> I beg to differ. I do it all the time. Literally. Compulsory heterosexuality. As Shrek is discovered listening in and makes his escape, we get to my favourite joke in the movie. Stop that. I've got no point to make here. I, it's just a great joke. I just love this joke and I want... I just love it. It's a great joke. It's a good joke. Such a good movie. But this escape transitions into the red carpet of the marriage ball, filled to the brim with het couples, which is immediately contrasted against Shrek's found family, who hate the ball shows, but just want to support their family. Yet, what we also see is the police here, violently arresting Shrek, Donkey and Puss. Bisexual comrade icon, Puss in Boots. This clearly represents another vector, yet another vector, of the heteronormative oppression of the social class of queer people. Just straight up violent state power in policing. And such power is resisted in the revolutionary actions of Shrek's found family who mount a daring rescue. During which it's revealed that Pinocchio is also gender bending. I'm, I, uh, I'm wearing ladies underwear. Another hero of the story refusing to kowtow to heteronormativity. And indeed this is particularly salient for Pinocchio, a puppet whose quest is to become a real boy with his consistent inability to achieve this goal and the notable exception of the fairy godmother's brief spell I'm a real boy. attempting to make things go as they should be. Um, maybe we should consider that Pinocchio's quest to become a real boy is fated to failure and his real story is accepting that trying to perform this real boyhood, this real masculinity, is holding him back from who he really is. Who she really is. After being broken out of the Straits jail, Shrek and his family form a plan of rescuing Princess Fiona. Storming the castle in an ironic mirror of the classic Roman de la Rose, except this time Shrek isn't trying to steal a kiss from his beloved, but trying to stop a kiss stop the performance of heteronormative stories. I don't think it's coincidence that in their storming of the castle, the giant gingerbread man Shrek is riding destroys both the fairy godmother's billboard and the Starbucks cup, symbolising the destruction of the co-constitutive powers of heteropatriarchy and the capitalist industry. The revolution must be queer. Like I said, this is where we don't acquiesce to heteronormative society, but smash it. 
And this leads to the thrilling third act, as in a final gambit to get Fiona on side, the godmother performs what is undeniably an absolute club banger. Which again, draws on classic camp performances. And you know, as much as she's an evil enforcer of heteronormativity, you simply cannot deny the power of this art. And you know, maybe that's the point. Maybe it's like powerful art when mobilised in a pernicious way can be deeply malicious. Even and maybe especially when it draws on queer aesthetics. Much to consider. The layers. Ogres have layers. It's true. As well as being an undeniable club banger, this performance is filled to the brim with irony, as the lyrics replicate the classic story of the Romain de la Rose, while the song is mixed alongside Shrek's orchestral theme, fighting within the composition as Shrek fights against the established story. Shrek isn't the hetero figure, he's something more. Him and his found family are something better. Incidentally, the music director for Shrek 2 is the same as for another revolutionary piece of art which I love, Chicken Run. Coincidence? I think not! Notice also during this scene, Prince Charming holds that symbol of hetero love, the rose, in his mouth, only letting it drop as he tries to kiss Fiona. And yet, in another deeply ironic turn, Fiona takes the symbol into her mouth as a method of self-defence. And you may think the scene is just replicating classic ideas of romance literature, but I think the layers of irony are too many to ignore, too many to fit it into that narrow understanding. And we can see this as the film runs to its conclusion. We get the coming together of all these various ironic threads. Firstly, as Charming kisses Fiona, without her consent, lots of rape culture stuff in the established story. The story says, the, the fairy tales, everything says that this should mean she falls in love with her Prince Charming. But instead, what she does? She just headbutts him. Queen. Queen. You know, which is partly the result of the king finally eking out a small level of resistance uh, and not giving her the love potion. She was supposed to give her the potion! Well, I guess I gave her the wrong tea. And all this is followed by the king, his little, his small bit of resistance leading to his big moment of resistance, which is uh, him being outed by the fairy godmother as her last ditch attempt to violently enforce the story's established pattern reflects off his armour, killing her and revealing his queerness to the world. I'd hoped you'd never see me like this. Hey, and he gave you a hard time. Turn the friggin' frogs gay! Do you understand that? Although he still holds on to some of the internalised shame, some of that internalised homophobia, Harold knows that he'll never be free if he remains subject to this compulsory heterosexuality. And he can't let Shrek and Fiona suffer the same fate. He has to come out. There's no other choice. He accepts who he is in that moment of rejecting the fairy godmother. And as the Queen says, as a frog, You're more that man today than you ever were. Warts and all. He is more himself than any time before. Finally, as Shrek offers Fiona the choice to be assimilated, a sacrifice which would destroy Shrek like it destroyed her father for years, Fiona says no. They reject these normative bodies and embrace each other in queer joy. I think it's actually very telling that in this moment they don't kiss. They don't perform that symbol of the Roman de la Rose. They simply embrace. And because of this dialectic of symbolic rejection yet total embrace, this moment is all the more meaningful. And even as they finally do go to kiss, repeating the motion from the start of the film which showed they were finally at home, which in turn shows Shrek and Fiona finally uh, at home and far, far away, having fully rejected heteronormativity, this turn is placed into the background. Isn't we supposed to be having a fiesta? And is also interrupted by Puss in Boots and Donkey singing Ricky Martin. The famously gay Ricky Martin. Not a rose, not a dove in sight. Do I have to explain it any further or can we admit 
that Shrek 2, in rejecting heteropatriarchy and embracing their queer selves, experiencing queer joy, truly are living la vida loca. It's a masterpiece. A queer masterpiece. Now, I'm sure that many of you will pick apart some of the aspects of this queer reading of Shrek 2. You might point out that it could be read in completely different ways. You know, for example, lots of people have pointed out that the themes of assimilation and marginalisation can be read as a negotiation of Jewish identity. It's not as unbelievably tight a mess of metaphor as Chicken Run is for revolution, and it is filled with contradictions and ironies, and as such has many readings. Read one way, it may reinforce particular aspects of hitch normativity. Like, if you don't understand Shrek and Fiona as symbolically queer, then you might have trouble. But that's the role of queering media. To read it in such a way as to emphasise its queer potential and in doing so communicate queer ideas to the world. Maybe on its own Shrek 2 isn't as queer, but media exists in a constant relationship, a constant renegotiation with its audience and the wider world. And if we the audience queer Shrek 2, then we make it the queer masterpiece. We have the power. God, I love Shrek 2. Alright, thank you for watching, listening and watching. Uh, I hope we're all pretty much convinced now that Shrek 2 is basically the gayest shit that has ever been made and may probably will ever be made. Um, this, is, this is my contribution to Pride. Uh, it felt a bit bad that my, my only video on Pride was a relentless criticism of, of Pride and, uh, you know, in this day and age when uh, queer people are being outright attacked on the streets, we should probably have some moments where we can just be like, this shit's gay and it's fucking brilliant. Um, anyway, uh, if you liked it, then you can always sign up to my Patreon or give a one off tip via PayPal or Ko-fi. And um, people who are $10 patrons and above get their names read out. Uh, $5 get their names in credit. So I'll, I'll just read out all my lovely wee uh, $10 patron names now. We have Demo Squid, Dying of Thirst, Bonnie, Kate Marshall, uh, Nina G Public Relations, FD Signifier, Lizzie G, Quint Wolf, Kim Crawley, Anita Anispe, Ellis Wren, Sophie, Hey Joe, Cameron Blakemore, TBS, Kien, uh, Christopher Poff, Morgussi, Daniel Cousid, Joshua Moldenhauer, Tom Price, Cades Worry, Esoteric Fictionalism, Shingo, Austin Talman, Polo Lonergren, Robin, Rachel Mixkin, Michelle H, Rich, Niels Abasgard, sorry, Abeldgard, uh, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Aga Ghost, ba Barney Carroll, Joe, Daniel Hughes, J. Fraser Cartwright, Aaron, Tamash Kispeter, and Paul Singleton. And if you like this video, then like, share, and give it to other folk and all that jazz. And yeah, bye, love you, bye bye. And also, he has who's. So if it was about that, like presumably he had to do it to himself to get like this, this, the fertilizer out. Did he like do it with his hooves? Like, like, or, or did they get someone else involved? Is there like a threesome? Did someone else not know? Was he taking advantage of? God knows.